we go back to my statement where I was talking of motivation having special connotations when you talk of it in context of organization management. And a definition which I propose to you is the following. It's not a perfect definition, but at least it puts you on track on what I wish you to understand. Psychological processes that cause the arousal of direction and persistence of voluntary action that are goal directed. Now, there are certain key phrases in that statement. Motivation causes the arousal of what? Direction. Not just the arousal, then persistence of what? Voluntary action. In what manner? That is goal directed. That is motivation in management. Motivation is essentially voluntary. Motivation in management is essentially goal directed. Similarly, leadership. Leadership is the task of ensuring once people remain committed to the goal set. It is not a la Shakespeare, once more onto the breach, dear friends, once more or seal the wall with our English dead. If you remember Shakespeare at all, which I think would be heresy itself to most of you who have no reading habits. But that is not leadership the way we teach management. That is very important. That is leadership. When you are prancing around onto the breach and trying to exhort your people to go back to battlefield, that is leadership in action, but it does not have any use in management. Task of ensuring that once people remain committed to the goal set, the well known saying aptly summarizes that a leader is the final test or so, so what a leader is. The final test of a leader is that he leaves behind in others the conviction and the will to carry on. A very unusual definition of management, but worth looking about. A leader does not perpetuate himself. A leader does not do others work while keeping them goal directed, there is an inspirational role of a leader. Of course, you cannot inspire dead wood. So, please understand it takes two to tango. There is so much said on leadership, I do not want to ham the subject because my purpose in this uh, presentation is to look at the socio-cultural aspects. A job performance model, if you look at motivation, this is what it comes to. There are individual inputs, there, are, there is a job context. The individual inputs are ability, job knowledge, disposition, traits, emotions, moods, affect, beliefs, values. And this is a non-exhaustive list. The job context are physical environment, des task designs, rewards and reinforcement, supervisory support, coaching, social norms, organizational culture. When you put together the individual inputs with the job context, the wheels start moving, which is why there is an interactory relationship which is shown there by this arrow. There is another connectivity with the motivational processes, arousal, attention, direction, intensity, persistence. I have already explained this. This leads to a motivated behavior, but job context must enable and limit. So, really speaking, motivational behavior requires skills and has to be enabled and put under limits. Itna bhi excited mat ho jaiye ki aap jig shuru kar dijiye. Everything is assessed in a simple proposition, are the organizational goals being achieved? And there is a broad band to it. 
job performance model if there is an individual input and there is a job context and there is a motivational process, motivational pr process has leads to motivated behavior, intensity, quality, duration. Ah, this is very important. Performance is a factor of persistence. You can't say I lie as a lifestyle, but I speak the truth twice a day. You know the old quip which has gone around so often it does not even need to be rep uh, repeated. You have two watches, one which has stopped and one which shows inaccurate time. By 10 minutes which one will you buy? And if you do not know the answer to that question and if you are from the hard discipline who wants accurate time twice a day, well then obviously you will go for the watch which has stopped. But if there is any wisdom on it, I do not have to answer that. In other words, management believes in functional effectiveness, not self-congratulatory precision. What use is the precision will be the question. I am not suggesting that precision is irrelevant, but in the pursuit of precision, you have to ask yourself what use is it. If it has to do with microns, yes precision is very important, otherwise you would not get your output. But if it has to do with behavior, precision is impossible, which is what leads me to say that you have to look at what is the issue and what works. The role of leadership in creating a sustained culture, what does a leader do? Leader creates and nurtures the culture including realignment of changing components and also ensures the alignment of core cultural issues with the values. In case you do not understand this, this leads a bit of an explanation. Nothing is static. There is a Latin statement which means panthere, everything changeth. You are changing every moment. You know of the many amusing quotes which arise from love talk between two individuals. The man turning around to the woman and saying, Tum badal gai. now you have changed. Then what did you expect me to do? Be the 14 year old running around meadows and vice versa of course, no gender bias. You have changed, obviously I have changed. When you met me, I was 20, I am now 29. When I was 20, my father was supporting me. At 29, I have to support my ailing mother. What do you expect me to do? I am still getting you your book. Eh? The question, my dear, is have you changed? And if so, in which direction? And can you change to keep pace with me? which is why the best relationship is where both grow together. And it is only people who grow together can continue friends. Read Henry the second part two. And for those of you who, who do not know this, it is the story of Prince Hal. And Prince Hal had a group of merry men around him. And there was a character there well celebrated in English literature, Falstaff. Now Falstaff enjoyed his drink as only he could enjoy. And in part two, Prince Hal has graduated to the throne and there is a battle on. And everyone is busy in the battle and there is Falstaff on his horse with a swig of whiskey. So, Prince Hal in the middle of the fray notices Falstaff having whiskey in the battlefield. So, he rides past him and he says, Fie get you on. To which Falstaff said, And why? To which Prince Hal says, Honor pricks you on. For the sake of honor, god damn it. 
the rest of the play is goes on to on, to, on to another track and i don't have to quote that if you don't get to grow even with your friends who are continually continuously growing you get behind left behind like fall stuff you get left behind in a companionship you get left behind in a marriage so understand that the basic law of life is change it is the leader's responsibility to keep the alignment amongst the changing components i think it's a beautiful definition i know it is fashionable these days to talk of transformational leadership and inspirational leadership god bless the ball i have nothing against anything but the truth is the truth of life requires handling the routine more than handling the innovation it's nice to talk of excellence of course you must try for excellence who can quarrel with that but it's also important to have a nice toothbrush and brush your teeth regularly no one talks of brushing teeth regularly it's nice to have good food habits regular food habits nobody ever talks of that everyone is talking of healthy food i know big fit is such a fad these days but why doesn't anyone talk of regular habits which shows that your whole biological system is adjusted and if you have had breakfast all your life at 8 o'clock and then suddenly when you are 26 your breakfast is not served by your darling wife who gets up late till 10 o'clock then your whole bodily system have their endocrines pumping into your stomach which will in course of time cause you ulcers and you can check this out with any medical doctor if your body is conditioned to get food at a certain hour you better put some food there for the secretions not to damage the lining of the stomach simple law of life so yes i know talking of innovation is so fashionable and i might add so important and to give conviction to my statement i'm fully aware of how to research on it i have conducted management management development programs on creativity long years nobody has to convince me about innovation but while talking of innovation i can't forget that there is such a thing as a routine and it is my case at this point of time in life to emphasize that you cannot innovate unless the routine is taken care of and yet it's not fashionable of taking care of the routine the little will talk of institutional excellence surely you have your institutional excellence can i get the establishment section to produce my paper which i sent 10 days ago seeking permission and they have lost it again whose job is it to put it quite simply you can't innovate unless the routine is in place it is my case therefore that a leader's responsibility is also to keep the routine working as per some standards only it's not fashionable to talk about it how do you do it personal example by influencing behavior and attitudes by creating culture enhancing structures by experimenting and being flexible it seems to me that leadership in management is something much more than leadership at war leadership in a group leadership in a family where also it has important dimensions but you must understand of leadership in organizations and what have i said so far it is the leadership's role to keep the 
changing components of an organization aligned. It is a design issue. I have also told you that it is important for leadership to make sure the routine is in place before they can innovate. And the only way you can motivate people is by your personal example. I would like to emphasize never expect people to follow a behavioral model for which you do not stand yourself. They may count out to you. They may even celebrate you because it suits them to celebrate you. They may even develop a fondness for you. But you would have failed as a leader. It is also my case that to be a leader, you do not necessarily have to be popular. A leader has to take a tough call. A leader has to tick off. And I believe that a leader has to call a spade a spade. Now, that is not the same thing as being rude. Style issues are different and I will be talking about it in another session. Right now, I am talking of content. A leader is a leader till such times that he is fulfilling the organizational goals and if he is not fulfilling the organizational goals, he should demit office. In fact, life's truths are that if you do not demit office voluntarily, circumstances will make you demit office. Classification of motivational theories needs to be drawn to your attention and there are certain theories which are content based, certain theories which are process based and certain theories which are reinforcement based. Now, what I am doing is I am clustering the theories because I am not conducting a session in psychology, I am conducting a session in organization management. So, I do not think it is my responsibility to explain to you each theory and how it originated and how it developed and what are what is its critique. It is important to keep that at the back of your mind, but each learning teaching process has to adjust to a schedule has to adjust to a methodology and it is my choice that I cluster these theories together and I have taken the liberty to captioning them contest content based motivational theories, process based motivational theories, reinforcement based motivational theories and believe me I am in good company a lot of people agree with this. So, what is the defining characteristic? What is the distinguishing characteristic between one cluster of theories and another cluster of theories? The content based theories focus on the needs. The process based theories explore the internal reason why a person responds in a particular manner. And reinforcement based theories focuses on environmental events which determine a person's behavior. So, one is needs, the other is the internal reason, the third is the environmental factors which you will agree amongst three covers uh, vary, uh, the, the entire range. In this diagram, I am showing to you where the different theories like McGregor, Herzberg, equity, operant fit in. I am not going to explain all these theories in great detail, but I will refer to them brief, briefly because my purpose is to explain what is the distinction between content process reinforcement and amongst the content based theories there would be Maslow's, ERG, McGregor, Herzberg, McClellan's. And amongst the process based theories are equity, goal, expectancy. Amongst the reinforcement based theories are the operant ones. 
Of course, you have heard of Maslow, and of course, you have talked of his hierarchy of needs. But remember, the theme is socio-cultural patterns, and socio-cultural patterns at work and behavior require you to understand that Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs can be split up into three components: behavior, which causes action; goals, needs. And he, the three key verbs are satisfy, achieve, drive. So, needs drive behavior, behavior helps to achieve goals, and goals satisfy needs. So, it is an interactory relationship. The purpose of this diagram, like any other diagram, is to help you to understand the relationships amongst the variables and to help you to understand the flow. Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs talks of uh, needs that are required to sustain life. Obvious listing, air, water, nourishment, sleep, these are broadly termed by Maslow as physiological needs or the needs which are essential for survival. Then he talks of safety needs. Everyone wants to live in a safe area, everyone wants medical insurance, everyone needs job security, everyone needs financial reserves and therein comes the birth of certain institutions, certain class of institutions. My purpose of getting into a hierarchy of needs is not to tell you that needs have a hierarchy that you should know anyhow. My purpose is to tell you how needs can be used to establish certain class of institutions. Job security and search leads to the birth of headhunters and employment exchanges, not educational institutions. Financial reserves leads to the setting up of financial intermediaries, institutions in the capital market, institutionals, institutions which deal with investment. Medical insurance, such a flourishing line of business. It is my prediction that many other insurance systems, security systems will fail, medical insurance will never fail for the coming 10 or 15 years, it is growing to go leaps and bounds. Because two things are happening. Longevity is growing. Healthcare system is becoming more expensive. And the financial reserves of employers is receding. The ideal habitat for medical insurance to breed. If you look at the history of last 5 years or stretch it to 10, you will find that institution after institution has been cutting down on its retirement benefits. If you are not within 2 or 3 years of retirement, perhaps this assurance will not even make sense to you, but wisdom lies in looking beyond your nose. And Progressively, all employers are transferring medical care against insurance systems. Now, what is going to happen is the generation between 50 and 65 is going to fall between two stools because they are not young enough to have a long lead time to start investing and they are, they are old enough to start needing it tough facts of life. So, at the end of the day, go back to a basic principle of management, you have to play a ball where it is. You cannot ask the world to be reconstructed, because your circumstances in life have changed. Therefore, I use Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs to understand which one of the professions is on the way up and which one of the professions is 
on the decline and how long will this trend last. Then there are social needs. Of course, everyone understands that. The need for friends, the need for belonging, the need to give and receive love. Oh, this is the greatest money spinner of business. Archie's carts create more business than anything else does. And there are whole shops selling carts on the theme, I love you. God, how many, how many ways they have discovered to say that statement which is at least several millennia old and it will remain forever young. I love you. Wow, what an original thought. Who said themes become stale? The basic themes of life never become stale. Therefore, please understand the basic purpose for which an organization is born and will continue to survive and function is because it meets a need of the society. And Maslow, of course, captured this. Then there are esteem needs, self-respect, achievement, attention, recognition. One of the biggest industries today is the recognition industry. In fact, you have got a lot of institutions, especially in cities with prestigious nomenclatures who give awards and you pay for the medal and the medal itself is priced in a way in which the promotional effort is paid for, the, the, the shipment is paid for and the medal is paid for and you can display it and say, I received the man of the year award from institution ABC from this place and they will never say which university, they will say the talk of only the city of the university. It happens abroad, it happens in India. What are they doing? Tapping business out of the need for recognition. A lot of you may not understand it, but as soon as you get a fancy designation, they will post to you a mail saying, we have selected you after adequate survey and from the bibliographical list as the person to receive this recognition. Now, please send us so many dollars, so many euros, so many pounds for expenses. There are other agencies which want you to come to a seminar for a registration fee of 10,000 rupees. Of that 10,000 rupees, 4,000 has been put aside for the medal they will give you. Another 4,000 will go towards the conference expenses and 2,000 rupees for the profits. So, you can create business anywhere you want provided you understand the needs syndrome. Therefore, Maslow needs to be celebrated. You meet the needs for recognition, you can run a, run a business house giving recognition to everyone. The amazing thing is, when you do it in a clumsy manner, you think nobody else knows. But you go to another person's drawing room and you find a similar medal and you know that he got the medal the same way you did. Therefore, each lifespan of every business has a limit. And this is how the cookie crumbles, which is why I, I was maintaining not so long ago. At the end of the day, if you want to run a stable business, there is no substitute of pure and simple honesty. And finally, there is the need for self-actualization and this, the better organizations play on this. And if you get into an organization which helps you to self-actualize, you stay there. What does self-actualization mean? It is the summit of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is the quest for reaching one's full potential. Unlike the lower levels, this is need is never fully satisfied. Certain such types of needs are growth, achievement, advancement, meaning. You know, we all go around, what is the meaning of life? Nobody quite understood this. It is only your turn to start asking the meaning of life. But everyone wants to know, why was I born? Even my parents did not know. No, they did. And why will I die? 
Nobody knows. What doesn't prevent people from reading meaning into life just shows lead your life at the level of simplicity. So if, if there are qualities which I want to recommend it to you, be honest, be simple. Don't try to unravel mysteries. They are not meant for managers. Managers are supposed to keep the world going in a healthy manner. Now, of course, if you are a philosopher, then of course you should be exploring meaning or you can be I.A. Richards who wrote a whole book on the meaning of meaning. Very serious book, a major contribution in study of languages. And one of the great reasons for celebrating Richards. But this is, a, this is a presentation beamed at potential managers, practicing managers and people who run organizations, not linguistics experts. So again, the selection of the topic and the, the method of treatment and the method of presentation has to do with who you are talking to. Presumably, the audience for this kind of presentation are people who either who aspire to be managers or who are practicing managers or who want to do a renewal of their learning of management. Therefore, you have to understand the mix between setting up surviving organizations, continuing organizations, organizations which renew themselves and getting people into it who work for the organization and who keep growing with the organization. And the best organization is something which helps you to grow and something which makes sure you stay a growing person. Now to move on to something different, there is, there is theory X, theory Y, there is even a theory Z and there will be more theories. I have no patience to get into the niceties. It is very simple. Theory X says that authoritarian, repressive style, tight control is needed because people are negative. And then the critic says, if there is no development, then it will produce an illiterate manner and it will lead to a depressed culture. Theory Y says, people are positive, they need to be liberated, they need to be developed. They if you help them to achieve, there will be continuous improvement. God knows where the truth lies. And remember, truth always lies between two extremes. One of cliches of management. Where is the truth? The truth is between two extremes. So you have theory X and theory Y. The truth is something somewhere theory Y works, somewhere theory, somewhere theory X works, somewhere neither works. Now, of course, it is fashionable in management to develop questionnaires. It's fashionable to teach the methodology of applying these principles because the question which arises is, how do you know whether here theory X will work, theory Y will work? Now, you have got an intervention tool called the questionnaire and if you can look at this questionnaire very briefly, it will show that you can ask people to score certain questions. My boss asks me politely to do a thing, gives me a reason why and invites my suggestion. Now you are supposed to say always, mostly, often, occasionally, rarely, never. And then there is a scoring pattern. I will give you another example. I work best and most productively without pressure from my boss or the threat of losing or the threat of losing my job. Again, the answer is always, mostly, often, occasionally, rarely, never. Then you put a, a, a numeral next to these numberings, whether if you put five, you mean always, but if you put four, you say mostly. And so you score this questionnaire. And then there is a scoring scale, 0 to 15, strongly X theory management. 16 to 44, generally X theory of management. 45 to 59, Y theory of management. 60 to 75, strong Y theory. So you can administer a questionnaire and hope to understand which theory will work. Is this tool infallible? No, nothing in life is infallible. Does it work? Yes, most of the time it works. Can it make a gross error? Yes, it does make a gross error. This is meant to be applied at a level of certain critical mass.
It will work for a lot of people. But there is no such thing as an infallible questionnaire. Then there is Alderfer's ERG theory, a relationship between existence, relatedness, and growth. We all exist. We all survive because of relatedness. And we all want growth. That's what he said. So if you have a small organization which is perched, say, in the domain of knowledge management, is a research organization, is an R&D organization, is an organization which is working at the frontiers of knowledge, then you need the ERG theory because you understand existence, you understand relatedness, and you want growth. This will not happen, say, in an automobile assembly plant. Again, theories are therefore relevant and related to the kind of domain you are working in. Similarities to Maslow's hierarchy. Studies have shown that middle level of Maslow's hierarchy have some overlap. Alderf addressed this issue by reducing the number of levels to three. The ERG needs can be mapped to those of Maslow's theory as follows. Existence in ERG is physiological and safety needs. Now, again, I am trying to put theories together because I do not wish management teaching to be conducted like a psychology class. You want to study psychology? Go and do an MA in psychology. Nothing wrong with it. Psychology is a perfectly respectable discipline. But for heaven's sakes, do not learn management like you learned psychology. And somewhere during the session, I did tell you that the same topic can be taught in different disciplines, but the methodology of teaching has to be different. And therefore, if you are talking of motivational theories, you have to compare different motivational theories to see which one leads to what application. And that is that's what I am trying to show you here. The existence component of ERG roughly covers the physiological and the safety needs component of Maslow. The relatedness of ERG roughly talks of social and external esteem needs of Maslow. The growth needs of ERG roughly talks of self-actualization and internal esteem needs. So you can see that the difference between ERG and Maslow's hierarchy is not all that unbridgeable. And ultimately, what is it that you are trying to learn? You are trying to learn what tool to use in a managerial situation. Otherwise, why am I showing you a questionnaire? But I am not going to teach you on how to construct a questionnaire. For that, you, you should hire a techie. And a techie will come and construct a questionnaire for you. Again, techies, as I told you, are meant to be respected. It is an important profession. But the difference between a techie and a manager is the manager understands the needs and gives the profile of the instrument which he requires. The techie then creates that instrument. The techie is told, this is the kind of software I need. So, the techie goes and he breaks up the situation into a number of variables. He combines and recombines them. He imbues them with certain knowledge. Put together, you run the program, it does your calculation. So, why must I know modeling? What I need is an appreciation of modeling. I may not be able to construct a model and I can still be the say, chairman and managing directors. Indeed, most chairman and managing directors do not understand how the model can be constructed or decomposed and they do not need to understand. The manager has a helicopter view and to enable him to do his job, a lot of techies are needed. They are needed as systems managers, they are needed as software developers, they are known as they are, they are, they are needed as psycho psychology analysts, they are known as market research people, very important professions. But it is tragic to believe that if you are a good techie, 
you must be a good manager. No, there is no correlation. And the vice versa. If you are a good manager, you need not be a good techie. You may be contributing a lot to information systems theory and you may never know how to construct a simple diagram with the help of PowerPoint tools on your computer. You may not know how to draw a diagonal. And quite frankly, it is such a waste of time. Yes, but you must have an appreciation of how it is done because you would have to budget for the time. So, there is a difference between appreciation and expertise. Like Maslow's model, ERG theory is hierarchical, existence needs have priority over related net needs which have priority over growth. Differences from Maslow's hierarchy. In addition to the reduction in the number of levels, the ERG theory differs from Maslow in three main ways. Unlike Maslow's hierarchy, the ERG theory allows for different levels of needs to be pursued simultaneously. And this is important. There is a lot of concurrence in life. Multitasking is the law of life. How on earth can you say that if I am doing a diagram, and an ant is walking up my shin, I will ignore the ant. You may ignore the ant, the ant will not ignore you. Very gross example, but all evolved managers are known to do more than one thing at a time and not necessarily even concurrently. You can switch from one task to another. It is like mental drawers. I do not want to spend time discussing it, but the difference between Maslow's hierarchy and ERG theory is obvious because there can be different levels of needs. ERG theory allows the order of needs to be different for different people. How are they different? Is it that some people do not have esteem needs? Is it that some people do not have physiological needs? No. The relative ranking of the urge to pursue these deeds are different. Some people are simply more physical. They cannot talk without slapping on the thigh. They will tell me you are dumb. Where did you go? Dumb. Another person simply cannot put up with it. He is very cerebral. And that is what life is all about. People are made differently. Yet everyone has a nose, everyone has a pair of ears, everyone has a pair of eyes. So, how do you distinguish the mongoloid from the negroid, the negroid from the Indo-Aryan, the Indo-Aryan from whatever else, when all of them have a nose, all of them have a pair of eyes, all of them have a, and just in case you did not know, these are different races that inhabit this earth. The shape of the nose will be different. It is a nose all right, but the shape is different. The shape of the eyes will be different. Similarly, the ratios of the inner combination will be different. Everything live will have to breathe. The question is how? The ERG theory acknowledges that if a higher level of need remains unfulfilled, the person may regress to a lower level need that appear easier to satisfy. This is known as frustration regression principle. Thus, while the ERG theory presents a model of progressive needs, the hierarchical aspect is not rigid. This flexibility allows, allows ERG theory to account for a wide range of observed behaviors. For example, it can explain the starving artist who may place growth needs above existence ones and Go back to definition of poetry. Very often poets have died a lonely and a suffering death, be it, be it Wordsworth, be it Nirala, be it Edgar Allan Poe, 
all of them try to define poetry in some way. We do not have the time to get into different ways of poetry writing. Some believe poetry ar arises in pathos. Others believe poetry is rooted in ecstasy. Others believe poetry arises in life's experiences. It is a question. Edgar Allan Poe says, poetry is what was oft experienced before, but never so well expressed. That is poetry. Sumitra Nandan Pant said, Viyogi hoga pahla kavi, hirde se nikla hoga gaan. Umar kar aakhon se chup chaap badi bahi hogi kavita anjaan. It is the lonely man who was the first poet and poetry sprang from his heart and after he surged forth it would have flowed like tears unknown from his eyes and that's how Sumitra Nandan Pant defines poems. Now you put together Edgar Allan Poe and Sumitra Nandan Pant, what's in common? But we are not teaching literature here. We are using literature to understand a simple managerial point. And the managerial point is, be it Sumitra Nandan Pant or Edgar Allan Poe, none of them talked of the physical needs. They talked of the growth needs, growth needs of self-expression. And none of them said, you must have your hamburger before you write poems. Because according to Mr. Maslow, physiological needs come first. According to ERG theory, your growth needs can subsume everything. What you have got to understand is the nature of management, what works, works and what does not, does not. In medicine, they call it clinical sense. after you have had all the pathological reports and all the MRIs and, and all the scans and, and all the specialists have made their money at your cost. You submit it to the general physician, the general physician looks at it and he says, let me feel the lower part of your face and he goes feeling here. And he says, no, 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 I, 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 I do not think your glands are swollen at all, I do not think you need treatment. But what about my scan? Oh, that is all right. He was my friend. He had, I like you to visit him. That is management. There is nothing hard about management and there is nothing soft about management. Of course, people will continue to define management wishfully to approximate what they are specialists in. God bless them all. But it does not alter the reality. Ultimately, the manager has to have a clinical sense. Can it work? Can it not work? And if it works, what, what, what made Mr. Sloan so great? After the First World War and General Motors was in deep trouble and this is one of the classical stories which management, which everyone must be sensitized to. He commissioned as a the leader is supposed to commission a detailed study, which is of course, what everyone must swear by, should General Motors continue production or not continue production. So, of course, the researchers got into work. Questionnaire, scaling, graphing, analysis, you, you, you know the works, statistical and otherwise, statistical methods in management nothing wrong with it at all. Qualitative tools in management, nothing wrong at all and they produced a huge volume. God bless them for working so hard. And the story goes and I am using the word story not because this is fiction, but the narration goes, if you want a more tightly woven expression, the narration goes, Mr. Alfred P. Sloan looked at the report very closely and the report recommended that General Motors should be closed down and after having studied the report, he decided General Motors will continue production period. 
and the subsequent history showed that Mr. Alfred P. Sloan was right and all these hard researchers who had used all the tools and all the analysis were incapable of envisioning the future and preparing for it. Not because research is bad, not because research is unnecessary, but research does not answer life's questions. Simple. The research can give you certain insights, very useful. And I would be the last person to say research is irrelevant. But I will be the first person to say intelligence to use research is more important. You can't use a conclusion logically derived to alter the course of life. You have problems with your prostrate. You see three urolo urology experts. One says, well, yeah, I've given you this test, I've run you that test, I've done this scan, I've done that scan. He will make a lot of very intelligent exp expressions, move his hand, pull his face. There is never a book written yet in, what does this mean? And you, you, you are hanging on to his lips, what does he say next? And he says, you know, and then he shakes his head for another 30 seconds and you're going to pay for all that. And then he says, you see, uh, actually you will be the best judge to decide. Uh, you think the clinical systems are bad? Then he produces a questionnaire, six symptoms. Do you, do, do you have to go to urinate at 3 o'clock in the morning? Do you urinate every half an hour? These are all questions there which you are supposed to tick. And then you have ticked it all. He says, well, I think, uh, let's wait. I'll write your prescription. You go to another urologist. He says, oh my God, your prostrate got 80 percent in off size unless you get uh, operated here and now today you are going to get into serious trouble. Can I take you to the operation theater? I don't want to go to the operation theater. So you go to a third hospital, you meet, a, you meet another urologist. He says, uh, Dr. Gautam, uh, you know, you, you have got a strong reference to come to me. I'll be honest. I'll put you onto some medication. It is not likely to work. But let's give it a shot. My own view is, you would need an operation sooner or later. But if you do not do it within 6 months, you will be onto a cathedra. Now, Dr. Gautam being what he, he is, he comes back and writes his own prescription. I am going to take this medicine from this prescription, that medicine from that prescription. After all, it is my body which is the experimental symbol. And Dr. Gautam survives 10 years, no cathedra, no operation, nothing wrong, nobody even knows. Were the urologists foolish? No, they were not. Each one had a different clinical sense. Each one was re interpreting data. Ultimately, manager has to interpret a situation. Forget the story. If I talk about Dr. Gautam, then nobody is offended. You do not have to take it literally for heaven's sake. All stories with with strange overtones must be over oneself if you are a good narrator. I must quickly modify that word story, otherwise people who do not talk uh, like management would be saying, you see, even in the session he was talking of stories, which is why we say management is blah, blah, blah. No, the word story here means narration. So, sir, management is not storytelling. Management is theory illustration, application. And unfortunately, I do not teach control theory in electrical engineering. I do not even teach thermodynamics. I teach management. So, I have to narrate. And if narrations bother you, I am sorry, my narrations are essential to management instruction. Because unless I illustrate,
people will not understand the application. So the long and short of it is that these hierarchies of motivation may supersede one another depending upon the temperament of the person. And that is the message which I am trying to give just and therefore it does not make management a, a strange discipline. It happens even in medicine and that is what I was trying to tell you. After you have done your own oh, all your clinical analysis, nature has a strange knack of surprising. One doctor will say off to the operation theatre within half an hour otherwise this is going to burst. Another doctor will say that fellow is a quack. He was always a quack. I do not know where he got his degrees from. You take follow my advice. You will be all right by tomorrow morning. Now, you come back home and the whole family gets together in a caboodle. Now, which one is a quack? Because whoever is a quack ultimately it is at your own cost. So, of course, you take the convenient discipline depending upon your neurosis and your anxiety level and your ability to be motivated or otherwise. If you are the neuro neurotic type, you would say no more risks. I am rushing to the operation theatre. And if you are the scary type, no, no, operation theatre not for me. Remember choices are exercised as per one's aptitude. That is the larger point I am trying to make. do not lose the woods for the trees. Exercise of choices have to be carefully reasoned with a sound application of judgment. That is the phrase carefully reasoned with a sound application of judgment and that is what management is all about. Unfortunately, the socio-cultural paradigms do not always encourage this kind of approach and therefore, if you are a professional, you apply your judgment on very carefully controlled reasoning. That is my proposition to you. Herzberg's hygiene factors and motivators. He talked of two independent scales of satisfaction and no satisfaction and he talked of dissatisfaction and no dissatisfaction. He talked of dissatisfaction and no dissatisfaction with reference to hygiene or maintenance factors and he talked of satisfaction and no satisfaction with reference, uh, reference to motivators. I will come back to you shortly to explain what Herzberg and other theorists have to do with understanding socio-cultural factors in management and how they affect work and behavior. Thank mm -hmm. you.